Hello, I am here today to share with you part of a sermon from um, a preacher called Joe Henry Hankins. Uh, he was born at the end of the 18, late 1800s, just before the 1900s, and uh, preached in Texas and Arkansas until up until 1967 when he passed away. And um, the sermon was that men ought always to pray. And the question is, is do you pray? And when you pray, what do you pray for? Or who do you pray for? Um, of course, I'm sure if, if you're like me, you certainly pray for yourself. Um, but you know, prayer is more than telling God the things that you want. It's about sharing your needs and not only your needs, but your joys. and and letting him know how much you appreciate what he's done for you. And of course, in your prayer life, you want to pray for the church. Um, the church is God's bride here on earth. It's his intercessors for um, the lost in the world. We are to be his messengers. And You want the church to be powerful and you want the church to be strong. And as you are part of that, your prayer life, will have an impact on even the success of your church. So, you know, we pray for ourselves and we pray for the church. And, uh, but you know, there's another group out there that we need to pray for, and it's the unsaved. Uh, the unsaved have a need in their life and uh, a need like no other. And um, <clears throat> I'm just going to share with you part of his sermon. Uh, I'll be reading this. So if I look down, don't think that it's not wanting to make eye contact. I've just got to read what he says. Um, Reverend Hankins says that um, he started off his sermon with um, men ought always to pray. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continued coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And that's from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And what that saying is, is that we need to pray often. We need to pray continually. Um, God hears our prayers. He may not be on our time schedule for answering those prayers, but Nevertheless, he hears them and God loves you and he desires to do what is in your best interest. His, his plan is, is it you at the center, that your life would be all that it could be in glorifying him. But to the unsaved, it says, we ought to pray for unsaved people much more than we do. I have heard Christians, even preachers say that they didn't believe in prayer for the unsaved. I grant you that when a person is saved, he himself must make that final decision. You know, um, we can't make those decisions for people. We have free will. Every person has to decide for themselves. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a burden on our heart for those who have not come to know the Lord and the peace and the comfort that comes from having him in our heart. If he hardens his heart and stiffens his neck, all the praying in the world can't save him. The heartbreak of a mother can't save a boy from hell if he stiffens his neck and hardens his heart and determines to go to hell. But praying can bring the power of God to convict a soul, can bring the Holy Spirit upon a lost soul, can move the feet of a lost man toward the house of God and work wonders in his salvation. You know, we don't come to the Lord on our terms. We don't come to the Lord when we decide that we're ready. We come when the Holy Spirit convicts our heart and lets us know deep in our inner core that we are sinful, 
that we are unworthy of salvation and that we are in need of a savior and a recognition that Christ is the answer to that. And when that conviction is on your heart and when you feel the Lord dealing with you, that is a time that that decision is to be made. A lot of people will reject that thinking, well, I've got time. It's no, no problem. I've got plenty of time. Not knowing that that may be the last time that the Holy Spirit deals with that person. Did you know that Christians are the only intercessors that God has appointed to stand between the lost world and hell and plead for their souls? You and I, saved and washed in the blood of Christ, have the Holy Spirit within us here on earth, making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We have the risen, glorified, ascended Redeemer at the right hand of God making intercession for us. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? When we don't know what to pray for ourselves, when we don't even know what we need, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us, the throne of God, making aware our needs and our desires that are in our best interest. Have you ever thought what would happen if the Holy Spirit ceased his intercession for you? Have you ever thought what is going to happen to a lost world when God's appointed intercessors forget to pray for them and nobody else is left to stand in the breach? Nobody else left to stand between the living and the dead to intercede for a poor, lost, dying, hell-bound world. That is why the world is plunging into hell like it is now. That is why iniquity abounds. Churches have grown cold and worldly because God's people have been too busy about other things. We have forgotten to pray. Oh, prayer makes a mighty difference in the salvation of souls. Time. We all, we don't have time. We're too busy. We've got things that we've got to do. Yet, you have time to eat. You take time to sleep. You even take time to watch that favorite TV show that you like to watch, or you take that time to pick up and read that good book that you enjoy so much. So really, I don't have time is not an excuse for a lack in our prayer life. You know, we find time for those things based upon what priority they are in our lives. And we need to, and I need to make prayer a greater priority in my life so that I spend more time in prayer to the Lord. Prayer for the lost souls. To have a conviction for those who are living this world without hope, without any knowledge that God loves them, that there is a comforter, that there is, a, that there is more than what just they see day to day in this world to their life. That what they say and what they do impacts others. I am thinking now, and I'm reading from what Brother Hankins has written. I am thinking now of an old mother whom I knew personally who had a 19 year old boy. He had gone away from home three years earlier and she hadn't heard a word from him. A revival meeting was going on in their little country church. Now these revival meetings back in this day in these country churches, these weren't just a one hour at night meeting. These were probably tent meetings and they set up and they'd come and they'd preach in the morning, have dinner on the ground, preach in the afternoon and then come back and preach at night. And this would go on for an entire week. And people would ride in horse and buggies to get to these meetings. And there'd be crowds there under the trees sitting in straight chairs, couldn't get in the tents to hear what the preacher had to say. And one evening after service, she, her husband, and the rest of the family drove home in a two-horse wagon like country people used to do. When they got to the gate that opened into the lot, the mother <clears throat> got out and opened it. As her husband drove the wagon through, she said, Daddy, go on and put the team up. I don't know when I'll be in. I'm going to pray for our boy out yonder somewhere in the world and on the road to hell. That mother slipped out through the orchard and under one of the full fruit trees to tarry on her knees before God. The next morning she came in, got breakfast for the family and announced, Daddy, I can't go to church today. 
I want to stay here and pray because our boy is out yonder somewhere lost. We don't know what he, what is taking place in his life. All day long she prayed. And this is what the boy told me, the experience himself. And this is the young 19 year old son talking to brother Hankins and telling him what was the outcome of his mother's prayers for him. I was down in Southwest Texas on a cattle ranch below San Antonio. I knew I was going to hell just about as fast as a boy ever went at 19 years of age. Late that afternoon, I was riding that cow pony in a long lope over the, those hills on that cattle ranch, going to the ranch house, when suddenly something grabbed hold of my heart. I didn't understand, didn't know what was happening. I reined that pony up, jumped off, and went down on my knees by the side of that pony and prayed, Lord, have mercy on me. Let me go back home. I hardly realized what I was saying, but when I got on that pony and rode up to the corral and saw the boss, I said, I'm going home tonight. When the boss asked me what had happened, I said, I don't know, but I've got to go home. The boss gave him his pay and he boarded the midnight train. Just about sun up the next morning, he walked up to the front yard gate. When his old mother saw him, she began to shout the praises of God. He said that very day he went with her to the revival meeting and was gloriously saved. A mother can pray for her a mother can pray her boy from the far country to the foot of the cross. We will never know until we get to heaven how many are there because somebody wouldn't give up. How we ought to pray for the unsaved. It makes a mighty big difference if an unsaved soul knows somebody is praying for him. He may be as hard as nails. He may be unkind. He may say hard things to you, but those prayers touch the chords that nothing else will ever touch. When I was a pastor at Childress, Texas, God put an unsaved young man and his unsaved wife on my heart. They had a fine three-year-old boy. I went into their home to talk and pray with them. Finally, I won the wife to the Lord, but her husband was an awful sinner, a gambler, and a drunkard. He told his wife, if you get baptized tonight, I'll not be here when you come home. She asked me what she would do. And Brother Hankins said, God says if you love father, mother, husband, or wife more than him, you are not worthy of him. And I asked, do you love the Lord? Yes, I do. Then there's but one path. Follow it, and we will trust the Lord for the rest. She came that night and was baptized. And sure enough, when she went home, her husband was gone. He stayed away for three weeks. I told her, just hold on to the Lord. Finally, he came back. Again and again, I went by that filling station where he worked to talk with him. He was kind now and seemed glad when I came by. <clears throat> After a while, I got him to come to the services at the church. One day I became so anxious for his salvation that during the invitation, I walked off the platform and back to him. He resented it. I saw that I had to follow <clears throat> some other course. I asked God for wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That's James chapter one, verse five. God showed me what to do. When he came to the services, I would be standing at the door afterwards, shaking hands with the people as they went out. Taking him by the hand, I would say, I'm praying for you, boy. He would grip my hand right tight and say, thank you, preacher. That went on for several weeks. One Sunday morning as he came out, I took him by the hand and said, I'm still praying for you, boy, and will keep on until you're either saved or have gone to hell. I'll not give you up. He took me by the hand, folded his hand and squeezed mine real tight, and with tears trickling down his cheeks said, God bless you, preacher, keep it up. The Lord knows I need it. You'll never know what it means to an old sinner to know that somebody is praying for him. 
The next Sunday morning after I had brought my message and given the invitation, he was the first one down the aisle. I was so happy I jumped off the platform and ran down to meet him. About halfway down the aisle we met and he threw both arms around me, put his head over on my shoulder and wept for joy. As we walked down the aisle together, he whispered in my ear, Brother Hankins, would you mind if I say something to the people? Of course, I didn't. After we had gotten to the front, he took me bodily, turned me around, and with his arm around me said, Folks, listen. I'm a saved man this morning because this preacher and my wife wouldn't quit praying for me. If you could know what it means to a poor lost sinner to know that somebody won't quit praying for him, you would pray more for unsaved people. Oh, how we are to pray for the lost souls. Do you know anybody that doesn't know God? Who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you have a burden on your heart for them? Do you pray for them? You can't save them. That's not your job. But you can lift them up to the Lord and pray that He would deal with them through His Holy Spirit, that He would convict their heart and that he would show them that they would realize the need that they have in their life and that there's another way to live than the path that they've chosen. You certainly can do that. You know, um, in 2 Kings, it talks about four lepers. The city of Samaria was under siege and the people in the city were starving. They were eating their children. That's how hungry they were. And these lepers were sitting at the gate. And they were starving too. And the Armenian army was camped all about so that nobody could go in or out. And these four lepers decided, if we sit here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're going to die. Let's go to the Armenians. They may kill us, but if they don't, we live. And if they do, we but die. So they went, and to their surprise and shock, expecting to be greeted by guards and questioned, they found the camp empty. The Lord had sent a noise that scared the Armenians so bad that they got up and fled. They didn't even bother to saddle their horses. They ran literally for their lives out back across the Jordan River, back to their home country, Syria and there they are in this city and they starve so they eat and fill their bellies and see all the silver and gold that's left and they hide some of that for themselves and then they're sitting there eating and thinking you know it's it's not good that we don't tell somebody about this if we don't tell something's going to happen to us so under that conviction they went back to the gate of the city and they cried out to the gatekeeper, they're gone, the camp is empty. That's all they could do. What happened after that was entirely in someone else's hands. Whether the gatekeeper would pass the word on, when the king heard it, whether or not he would believe it and what actions he was take. But it was their job to go and say, the camp is empty. Food is there for the taking. That's all they could do. And that's all you can do. Is you can pray for the lost soul. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that God loves them. And lift them up. And trust that the Holy Spirit will convict that heart. And pray that that person will yield to that conviction. And accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Hope you get something out of this. Um, thank you so much for your attention and the time that you gave to, to listening to this. And we're praying for you and hope that the Lord blesses you. Thank you.